So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you uh, all for coming. And uh, for those who are here who I don't know and those who are uh, on the webcast, I'm Sandro Galea, and I have the privilege of uh, serving as dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. So this is the first of our um, fora throughout the academic year, where we collaborate with external partners uh, to bring together scientists and speakers from all over the world. Today, we're co-hosting with the Boston University College of Engineering. Ken Luchin is the dean there, and I want to acknowledge the partnership with the School of Engineering on this. At all of these events, we welcome speakers who help to better, better understand the social, economic, and environmental foundations of health. We live in a time, as I think everybody knows, when these foundations are being tested. Globally, we face challenges like the growing gap between rich and poor, infectious disease like Ebola, widespread displacement of refugees, and looming overall the threat of climate change. Meeting these challenges requires institutions that generate knowledge about the conditions that underlie health, knowledge which emerges from a vibrant tradition of scientific inquiry. The New York Academy of Sciences has long been such an institution. For 200 years, it has enhanced our understanding of the conditions that shape our world. For 15 of those years, Ellis Rubinstein has served as president and CEO of the Academy. He has done an extraordinary job of reinvigorating this distinguished institution. The Academy has worked with the United Nations Secretary General and UN agency heads on sustainability, advised heads of state on science, technology, and innovation policy, and established over 1,000 partnerships with corporations, universities, and non-governmental organizations in a range of areas, including Alzheimer's, malnutrition, early childhood development, science, and math education. Before coming to the education, Ellis has one of the most fascinating histories of anybody I know. He spent a decade as editor of Science, scientific journal with larger circulation in the world. And before that, he was in addition to playing other roles, a science journalist for a range of other publications, a senior editor at Newsweek, and a graduate in English from the University of California, Berkeley. On a more personal note, when I moved to New York, Ellis was the first person who reached out and invited me to dinner. And things like that you never forget. So thank you. Um, uh, today, um, Ellis Rubinstein is going to discuss how science and technology can help create a healthier, more sustainable world. And I'm very much looking forward to learning from him. Ellis. So since Sandro told you that little story that I, I didn't want to have credit for because I didn't remember about inviting him to dinner, I have to say that when my wife uh, knew that I was coming up here and I was invited to Sandro's house for dinner, he said, you know, Margaret, you remember? She said, remember, Margaret, uh, Margaret and Sandro, they are great cooks. So like I have him under pressure for tonight because <laughs> we'll see what he produces. And unfortunately, his wonderful spouse, who I'm sure you all know about, won't be with us, but she's doing something super important. And maybe you all know uh, in Washington, uh, launching a Lancet uh, uh, piece uh, that's on maternal health, right? Or, so. That's fantastic. Uh, very, very honored to be here, Sandro, and uh, looking forward to talking to all of you. Hope I can bring something to you that you don't already know. Um, one of the keys that Sandro mentioned is uh, that uh, I'm an English major. So what do I know? But uh, maybe we'll come to that. Um, I want to uh, particularly mention um, that uh, every day, I guess, I feel fortunate to be able to uh, have a position like being the head of the academy and also uh, for being uh, the editor of science for a decade. Um, because, uh, you know, not having been an English major and not being an expert, I guess my thought is the only thing that I can bring to these jobs is the curiosity that I was uh, trained to have as a journalist. And maybe the willingness to answer, to ask questions um, relentlessly and not to give speeches like this, and that uh, don't do this too often. Um, the key for me is to try to figure out the truth of things. And one of the things that uh, I thought in thinking about uh, uh, what I might talk to you all about is uh, the fact that my journalistic background made me pretty skeptical about things that now we see are possible thanks to science and technology and to the kind of commitment of people like yourselves. So what I want to do today is bring to you the amazingly idealistic notion that science and technology might save our planet. And, and uh, to preface that, I want to say that up to a decade ago, I would have never believed I would have ever said those words. Because the challenges of the planet, as we know, are extraordinarily daunting. Uh, I'm hoping that some of you, which I'm going to come to a little bit later, all know about the sustainable development goals and the metrics that are expected to be achieved by 2030. Based on uh, my personal observation of what was achieved by 2015 and what were then called, and again, I hope all of you know, the Millennium Development Goals, which I'm going to also talk about in a minute, 
I have come to the conclusion that we have an actual shot at achieving these sustainable development goals, and here's why. Um, I've seen with my own eyes uh, the unprecedented potential of some truly uh, disruptional agents of change um, that are arising from the power of three things. One, social networking, two, collective action, and three, science and technology. So in my talk today, I'm going to present as clearly as I can the basis for what I would call my own self-education. And my objective, as I said to some master's students uh, earlier, um, is to give you a little bit of the uh, optimism that I now have about what we can do if we all work together in a sensible, rational way. Uh, and I think that this kind of idea of a rational hope about the future uh, has never been more needed. I, I, I hope that every one of you in this room uh, might agree with me when I say that there's like no day that goes by that could be more discouraging when you turn on your TV about the state of the countries in the world and not to mention our own. And uh, so the idea of having some kind of ra rational basis for hope about making a better world is what I want to try to convey to you, uh, hoping that you can infect some others with that hope. And I want to turn back, uh, because so many of you are young, to the 1990s. Uh, to give you a, a kind of a benchmark uh, against which you could uh, measure uh, what's changed and what could be uh, uh, happening in the future. So uh, I'm going to start with what was, the world was like in 1990 with a little slide. Um, and, uh, and hopefully these, uh, this gives you a just quick indicator of that. Um, Two billion people living in extreme poverty, a billion of them now malnourished, 12 million children under five dying from easily preventable causes. 100 million or more children not attending even primary school, well over a billion not getting the skills needed to succeed in life, and so on. And if uh, I want to add to those uh, uh, horrific facts, a couple of exacerbating elements. Billions, as you all know, of the desperately poor were living in totally disconnected rural areas. Smartphones weren't even a fantasy in the 1990s. How can we even think that that was the case? this recently. And worse, billions of the rural poor were just beginning to be uh, pouring into urban uh, settings, slums, where the services were going to be overwhelmed. So in the face of this, um, what was the zeitgeist that I think of, at least, in the 1990s? And to give you a, a kind of a, a anecdotal uh, and hopefully vivid uh, vision of this, let me transport you back to uh, uh, that period when I uh, had the interesting challenge of moderating panels at the World Economic Forum in Davos for a number of years in a row, and tell you a couple of stories. First, uh, on the good side, I was surprised when I first went to Davos, and I think it was 1999, maybe it was 2000, the second year, because Klaus Schwab, who runs the World Economic Forum, had created entire sessions that were devoted to global problems. I didn't expect that to be the case. And, and at those sessions, he had invited on his dime, or on really not his dime, but all the industry partners, uh, the heads of all the big NGOs. So you would go to these sessions and you'd have the super important global organizations you think of, Oxfam, Médecins Sans Frontières, Greenpeace, and so on, all sitting and talking about how we, can have, to, we have to really address these global challenges in the world. And inside the sessions, they were so collegial. They were just so wonderful talking to each other. And then the minute you went into the Carters, you would find them huddled with rich people or big industrial guys stabbing each other in the back, trying to get attention to their particular charity. It was so depressing, I can't tell you. Now, another uh, thing to, to imagine, if, if uh, compared to the world today as we know it, is that if you talk to the vast majority of the industry executives that were there, that for them, the world was a zero-sum game. That no company could succeed unless it beats its competitor, and none of them would work together in any, they wouldn't even think about working together on any global challenges. And third, the notion of corporate social responsibility, which we take for granted now. We call it CSR, and people think we've moved beyond CSR. If it was ever mentioned there, it would be considered nuts. So I'm going to give you a, a good illustration of this, naming a guy named Peter Bakker, who at that time was the CEO of a Dutch company called TNT, which is like a Federal Express in Europe. 
And Peter uh, has given this wonderful speech that I've heard him uh, give about how one day he was sitting in a meeting with his communications and media and marketing people, and they were talking about their plans to put up big ads at the Le Mans racetrack. And he asked the question, how much money was it going to cost? I don't remember the number, but it was thousands upon thousands of dollars to get this fantastic placement for TNT at the Le Mans racetrack. So he said, I, you know, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm not going to give you the money for that because I'd rather use it for a different purpose. And he started a program, which he would then tell people in Davos about that year, where instead he took the money and he gave incentives to his own staff who wanted to volunteer and go to Africa on their time off and do something to help people down there. And people were shocked in his board. I mean, how can you do that? I mean, we have to market for making more money. And he said to them, okay, so you'd rather spend the millions, you'd rather make some millions while millions are dying and maybe they would shut up a little bit. When he would try to tell this story that first year to people uh, like his peers in industry, they thought that he, he says that he, he felt like he had come from Mars, that they, they couldn't understand what he was doing. And that was what I would say, not the 19th century, that was the way things were two decades ago. Now I'm going to come back to Peter Backer in a minute because I'm going to discuss the sea change that was to happen. But let me first uh, admit to all of you who are youthful that it wasn't as if nothing was happening in the 1990s. There were some important things that began, and maybe I'd call them harbingers of change. So let me start with uh, public health, which is your own area. Um, hopefully you all know that in around 1986, Carter Center, for example, took on the challenge of eradicating guinea worm, which probably was considered an idiotic idea. Working with Merck and others, there were 3.5 million cases then, and this year I understand there are 30. So that was a, a kind of an no, extraordinary project done by industry uh, out of its own goodwill before anybody was doing stuff like that. It made a huge difference. Um, also, there's another uh, area we can discuss, which is climate, because in April 22, 1990, citizens and leaders from countries celebrated the 20th anniversary of Earth Day by launching the, what was called that year the Decade of the Environment. And I want to remind you for a second of what happened that uh, particular year. So you see a little bit of a timeline on the bottom of that slide. And you'll see the sadly departed geophysicist Cherry Rowland uh, who's on the right in that picture, and his active part, still active partner, Mario Molina from Mexico. The two of them, back in 74, had alerted the world to the danger of CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. By 1985, the world had discovered that the ozone layer was disappearing like crazy on, over the Antarctic and was likely to spread north. And then came what was considered amazing news because countries started to band together uh, recognizing the risk and created a landmark agreement in Montreal in 1987 to phase out the use of CFCs in uh, refrigeration, spray cans, and so on. And by 95, Sherry and, and uh, Mario were awarded the Nobel Prize for that. Now, what was the effect of those, uh, of the growing group of uh, countries that got together to do this work? Um, as you can see from this slide, by 2015, the reductions have saved uh, an estimated 280 million people from skin cancer and prevented about a million and a half deaths. And, with this, and, the, and what this is telling you is why the then incoming Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, took a moment in a speech in late 2000 to specifically acknowledge the amazing effects of this. And you can uh, kind of read his quote there because he called it the single most successful international environmental agreement to date. It set a standard for international agreements. Crucially, it meant that Kofi had learned something about the possibilities of using the UN and global compacts in a way that we would have never seen before. And just for a moment, since I bring him up, uh, I hope that you all know who he is, um, and I just want to acknowledge the sad passing of him last month because, well, he wasn't a perfect man, which is a phrase we've been hearing lately about one of our politicians. 
he did spectacular things for the world if we could only have leaders like Kofi Annan. Uh, and I'm going to come to things that he did that relate directly to your world. Because that gives me a kind of segue to the integral part of what uh, we did to transform attitudes in the first decade of the 21st century. So I want to next touch on four trans what I would call four transformational movements that took place in the first decade of the 21st century from my point of view. And you will see them here. Um, I want to highlight the idea that the emergence of an appreciation of the potential of integrating efforts and of combining intersectoral and interdisciplinary contributions to achieve uh, goals created unprecedented synergies. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I also want to highlight the emergence of uh, the concept of social responsibility in the private sector. And the fact that we started to see on an unprecedented uh, level the emergence of public-private partnerships. And finally, one of the most amazing and unexpected powers that was the power of connectivity that was brought by smartphones and internet access. Now to illustrate the power of those four transformational elements, I want to touch on two examples, one a small one and one a kind of telling, uh, one a, a kind of enormous one. Beginning with the, smart, the short one, I'm going to take you back to Peter Bakker, who was from the planet Mars in year one when he started talking about his uh, effort to uh, encourage his own staff to go to Africa. So after he was shunned that first year in Davos for spending all that money, one of the things he was able to do uh, on, on his own staff instead of marketing, one of the things he was able to do was go to his board and say, and he was able to show them metrics about the increase in productivity of his staff working because they were prouder of TNT. So by year two, he discovered that three or four of his peers, who were CEOs of other companies, walked up to him and said, hey, whatever happened with that program you know, where you're sending the people to Africa? How did that turn out? And at least he thought, OK, at least somebody asked me. And he would tell them. But then what happened next was, in the following year, he had quite a few uh, CEOs, and it continued, inviting him. Would he be willing to come to their boardroom and explain the power of that program for his own company? So this shows that humans are capable of learning <laughs> something. And, and I think it, you know, it tells the kind of story that we all believe in. So I want to now tell you another uh, factoid, I guess, about Peter Bakker. He, once he retired from TNT as CEO, the World Bank in 2003 identified uh, a new organization called the World Business Council for Sustainable Development as one of the most influential forums for companies on corporate social responsibility. Today, there are 200 members of that organization under the leadership of, guess who? Peter Bakker. So these are the fiercest competitors in the world, all working together on opportunities to uh, create a sustainable planet from the corporate side. Now I want to go to the bigger example of how things changed in the, in the, from 2000 on. And uh, this is one where I'm just fortunate because I had a window seat on this because, as maybe a few of you know, or certainly Sandra knows, my wife was chief of staff to Jeffrey Sachs, the macroeconomist, and uh, those of you that recognize that name and know why this is the case, I'm going to show you a little bit of an example of what I learned myself. So uh, in around 2000 or 2001 or something like that, UN Secretary Kofi, General, Kofi Annan, Secretary General Kofi Annan, uh, having seen what he could do with the Montreal Protocol, uh, got 191 nations that were then every nation in the UN to ratify what were called the UN Millennium Development Goals. And I'm hoping you all know what those goals are, but I already discovered before that maybe not everybody has, remembers those goals or knows those goals. So I'm, I'm just throwing up a little, uh, a, a little chart to show what those goals were. You can see that there were mm, eight of them. And you can read for yourself uh, kind of how, what those goals, those goals were. Um, <clears throat> 
Um, I somehow have lost my uh, slide about them, but you can see eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, small goal. Achieve universal primary education, small goal. So these were incredibly uh, um, ambitious goals and idealistic. And what happened was that uh, many UN savvy people thought, okay, the agencies of the UN are never gonna be able to achieve these goals because they're too bureaucratic, they don't work together, and so on. And moreover, the question was, how would you even begin to think about doing that? So Kofi Annan decided that the way to actually approach it was to create a plan, but if, since his agencies were gonna fight like cats and dogs about who runs the plan, what will the plan look like, he decided to outsource that plan. And he went to Columbia University's Earth Institute, and he hired them, in effect, and Jeffrey Sachs, who was the leader, to actually try to build the plan. And, and Jeffrey uh, then assembled 100, I don't know, remember the exact number, 150, 200 experts in all the different areas of the goals and put them in kind of working groups. And over a period of a year, they built a kind of a concept of what you could do, what the metrics would be, and how you would approach them. And so Jeff, in particular, then came to a, a very important notion, which it has become crucial for everything we're gonna try to do if we're gonna ever achieve the sustainable development goals. He decided that one of the failures in the past for aid, as we saw it, was that it was siloed. How could you hope to raise people out of extreme poverty if your plan addressed diseases, but you left them starving? Or you got seeds and uh, fertilizers, but they were losing productivity because of uh, contaminated water. So Jeff thought, let's create a macro plan that integrates the aid and lets us cost it out to prove that it's affordable. Then he thought, okay, how am I going to actually convince people, even if I have this great plan, that it's possible to make it work? And even if I can pretend that I have a costable, you know, something affordable to do it. And he decided that he needed to create proof of concepts that would give people the confidence that it could be done. So he created 10 millennium villages. Each village was in one of the poorest places imaginable, totally cut off, no kind of access to those villages. People were starving. Everything was awful in each of those villages. And what, the, the way they were chosen was each one had a different agroecological challenge. So that basically, if you could figure out how to deal with the village that had, uh, was starving because their corn was, they were in drought and their corn crop wasn't working, or their animals were dying because of the drought there, and, and so forth, if you could solve each of the uh, food problems for each of those villages, all the other problems were common, water problems, education problems, and so on. So that was the way that he decided on the 10 villages. And then what he decided was that he would have to get help to those villages showing off the integrative uh, notion of assistance. So he would deliver anti-malarial benefits and HIV drugs. He would ensure better seeds and fertilizers and clean up the water. He would address maternal mortality and ensure that all children were gonna get lunch, you know, fr uh, f meals at school and therefore go to school. So this intersectoral exp expertise that he used, uh, he had to deliver that, and how was he going to deliver it? And this is where you know, I was able to see an amazing set of things begin to happen. So one example was, and I credit my wife, um, who convinced Sumitomo, the gigantic Japanese company, that was the only company, well, there were two companies, one tiny Danish company and, and gigantic Sumitomo company that had figured out chemically how to be able to uh, uh, create uh, insect-resistant uh, uh, malaria bed nets. And so the question was, uh, insecticide-treated malaria bed nets. So the question was, how could you get Sumitomo to create enough bed nets when there was no market? Who was gonna pay for them? These, these were the poorest villages. So they pushed and pushed and convinced Sumitomo that there would eventually be a market. They and Sumitomo started producing them at scale. Uh, then a uh, very dynamic guy came in and started the Million, million Bed Nets uh, uh, Foundation, raised tons of money and between donor, uh, donor agencies and, and philanthropy, 
uh, so Sumitomo got some money back for all these bed nets that it had created and the new ones that it was creating. And then Sumitomo decided to create a factory for these in Africa so that there started to be even a, an economy of getting people jobs in Africa for doing those bed nets. So that's one example. Monsanto provided fee seeds, Veolia helped with the water, and uh, GSK and Pfizer, if I remember, did a lot of work with drugs and brought dentists to, to the villages and so on. So now here's what happened that was uh, astonishing to me. I, got, I had the good luck of going to one of these villages. It was in Kenya, the Sauri village in Kenya, almost right near, near where Obama was, uh, a family came from. And, and what I saw was that in effect a public-private partnership had been created by Jeff without the companies even realizing they were in one. And things within one year had so dramatically transformed that when Jeff came to visit and all the ministers were going to see what happened and they knew the TV network in Kenya was going to film it, so they all wanted to come. And so now they come to this village and I see the minister going, Holy smoke, look at the size of the corn, you know, it's like up here, how did that happen? And then he would see piece after piece, the water is all clean and everything now, how did you do that? So then he gets on TV and he says, isn't it amazing what we did here in our village in, in Kenya? So, of course, he wants to take credit. And what he didn't figure out was what was going to happen next. People who had come from the you know, next villages in the next district came running up to him and go, but you just did that for that village? So you can do it for our village. Oh yes, we're gonna put this in the budget for next year. And I realized that of course, not necessarily everything's gonna be perfect, but this is a genius thing. This is how the proof of concept works. Because before that, honestly, even if they were good or bad ministers, they wouldn't know that it could be done. And then once they see it, they want credit for it, and then they're going to be incentivized to try to do it. So how about doing entire districts? How about learning from entire districts to do the whole country? Now I'm going to show you a slide from an, another visit that I wish I was on. I wasn't on this one. From the village of Dertu in, uh, in the northern, in very northern Kenya. This is desert area. I'm sorry I don't have better specific photos of what I'm going to tell you about, but this story is a wonderful story. And this is the, I, w I went hunting for these photos in my wife's stuff and my stuff, and I, these are the best ones I could find out. So you can see it's kind of desert area. And one of the things, this is a herding area. This is where people were living on their herds, their camels. And one of the things you see on the right side is you see a disc, you know, uh, um, and then you see, maybe you can see the, the little tower, which is actually a solar powered tower that provided the first ever connectivity to a place in the middle of nowhere. And the reason this guy is smiling over here on the lower left, he's Carl Henrik Svanberg. Today he's the chairman of Volvo and he's, he's a Swede that we know very well, but at that time he was the CEO of Ericsson. And my wife, had convinced him to come down with his wife to some of the villages. And he had seen the situation in the villages. And he felt really badly uh, about this. And he got to thinking, OK, I can't make a business case, but at least I could get Ericsson to put a tower in every one of your villages, Jeff, in every one of the 10 villages, and provide connectivity. So what was interesting about this story in several respects is for, I think, a global health audience too, is that nobody had actually thought that this was part of the plan because nobody had thought about connectivity and mobile phones at the, when they were first doing the plan in 2001 and 2002. They had set up all of this without the idea that there was going to be connectivity. And all of a sudden there was connectivity. And the reason for me showing you that story is there's two stories about this that are really interesting. One story, I don't have the picture of the village chief that sat down behind the first computer that he had ever seen. And Jeff was basically trying to tell him, so we're going to give you this smartphone for the village. And one of the things you're going to be able to do is that if your wife is suddenly experiencing a, disastrous, a disaster in childbirth, you're going to be able to use this phone to call the clinic and get an ambulance to come and save your wife. And the guy looked at Jeff and said, that's nice, 
And Jeff says, aren't you happy about that? He says, well, I'd rather do, use the phone for something else. And Jeff said, what? He said, well, I'd like to know, could you, if I called, would somebody tell me if there's water at the watering hole 300 miles from here? Because if my, my uh, camels don't get water when I send them there and they die, the whole village dies. And that was a moment in time where a lot of really impressive experts in global health realized that until you talk to the people, you don't realize what the real priorities are in doing global health. Because he didn't want to lose his wife, but he didn't want to lose his village more. So the other wonderful story is a little more touching because that's a little bit of a creepy story. And that's those kids. So one of the kids sat down in front of the computer and they were trying to show him Google Earth. And they said, we want to show you where your country is. So, and you know, you remember how Google Earth comes down and looks very, and he sees his country and he says, and he says, okay, but where are we? And what do you mean? It's like, can you show us where we are? I don't know where we are. And so that was the first time that they had ever seen themselves anywhere. They had any idea of where they were in the world. So people were, as you can imagine, tearing up with this. Now, <clears throat> I think the you know, basic take home message basically is to me two points. <clears throat> Those villages, some of them made enormous strides. If you went to Rwanda uh, and you looked at the village there, you wouldn't recognize what it was uh, four or five years before. Uh, it's like a thriving community. You know, a whole area around it is a thriving community. Um, Saori village is dramatically better than it was in Kenya. I'm not sure about this one because some of the villages had problems with terrorism. This is very close to the border. And, and, and had some terrorism. The one in Mali, uh, that was overrun, and for a long time they couldn't even work there. So there were some issues about that. There are some issues about what the actual costs of some of the, of the interventions were, and were they as uh, efficient as had been hoped, or was the costing done exactly right? But the basic uh, discovery was, at least from my point of view, was not merely that you transform the attitudes of the ministers in the countries, not merely that you showed a path to experts from the World Health Organization, from all the big global donors and so on, but isn't it interesting how if you took a look at what uh, Bill Gates and Bill and Melinda Gates have done in Africa, spectacular work, or the Clinton, Clintons and stuff, many of the elements, whether it's stated or not, came out of that, that plan. So essentially, gradually, even after unbelievable fights, example, WHO at first wouldn't accept the idea of giving free bed nets to every, every uh, uh, person you could for idiotic reasons, and then they finally decided, oh, they would. So that was a really important uh, change in, 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 in essence. Now I wanna... Um, give you a couple more examples of uh, how things changed that I'm not going to attribute entirely to Jeff Sachs, but I'm going to attribute to the zeitgeist change that took place. So, you know, what could be more astonishing, and I can tell you if you thought about it in 2002, you wouldn't believe 1.3 billion people would emerge out of extreme poverty, that child deaths from preventable diseases would be halved, that 200 million people would no longer be going to bed hungry that would have been then. And so it was based on this kind of a improvement, malaria dramatically reduced, that Ban Ki-moon, by then the new Secretary General, decided to take the next step and try to organize all the countries in the world, and it was 197, to vote to uh, endorse the Sustainable Development Goals. And in case, as I discovered from a couple of master's students, not everybody remembers or knows exactly what the Sustainable Development Goals are, there are 17 of them. They're like daunting. Uh, they make the Millennium Goals look like a piece of cake. They're voting to end poverty and hunger. But I want to touch on goals three and four, three because of you and your interests, and four because of me. 
because I think they go together. So I think that without achieving goals three and four, we're not going to be able to achieve many of the others. In particular, if you just look at that chart, if you look at five, which is about women's empowerment, or eight, or 10, which is, I think, uh, economic inclusion, you can't see it from here, or 11, these goals cannot be achieved without an educated, healthy populace. We can't, we can't uh, continue to have the number of people left off the, off the grid that we do. So how could we possibly, drilling down on goals three and four, make some progress? So let me give you a, a picture of some of the key targets under goal three. Do you want to, wanting to interrupt? I just want to ask one quick question. Sure. So, you know, uh, you wouldn't know, but a lot of the young people here at, uh, at the public school, just masters and PhD students, were asking me, because I used to be a journalist, about that very problem. And the problem is that uh, on the one side, the UN never wanted to exactly credit Jeff Sachs. Jeff Sachs never really wanted to make even a bigger uh, thing about himself than, than he was. He's already under attack from a lot of people. And so the thing sort of hides under the carpet of going into the next level. That's part one. Part two is the problem that we, I have to admit as a journalist, that unless you constantly have stories that you can convince CNN or BBC or others to show. So, you know, I mentioned to some of the kids, since you just touched on this, that one of the exciting moments for me back in the early days when I didn't think anybody believed in these things even possible was when MTV got convinced to take Angelina Jolie with Jeff Sachs in some uh, you know, uh, chauffeur-driven car around to some of the villages. And she's a very serious person. She's just not a, 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 your average actress. So kids that were watching that show, you could go back probably and find it for an hour show. They learned a lot about the real, real world that, that was and the challenges we're facing and also the opportunities to fix stuff. If we could only do that all the time for the kids of the world. My answer, and I'm going to jump to maybe a question and answer for later, but I'm not going to touch on it now, is that's one of our biggest goals at the New York Academy of Sciences. We're doing projects for high school kids all over the world, and, they, and their, their task is to work in little uh, multinational teams to address global uh, the, these sustainable devo development goals, challenges under these sustainable development goals, to get them excited about what they can do themselves in these areas. And my hope would be that we begin to crack the ignorance gap by going to the kids, getting them engaged, because those kids, they may have parents, they have no interest, but the kids, once they love, they love that, the opportunity to help the world, that's like been one of our greatest successes. But anyway, I'm jumping ahead. So if you, if you let me go, I'm gonna go a little bit further with this. So on, 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 these are the targets on, on, uh, on getting a, a good health. And, and you can see how daunting they are, reducing by one third deaths from non-communicable diseases, uh, ending epidemics entirely, making enormous reductions in maternal and child deaths. So for a group like this, I mean, I think you know that uh, one issue is, of course, the science itself, the big pharma companies coming up with vaccines, funding them, doing all the other kind of stuff. We only have 11 years. So, you know, we need that kind of advance in science and technology. There's a lot of wonderful stuff that's happening all the time. It's the world that I've in, inherited as I became a, a science journalist and now the head of the New York Academy of Sciences. It's thrilling to watch it. But to me, the more sophisticated question is, you know, how can we actually uh, work together to make these things uh, uh, clearly able to happen and scalable in the way that the Millennium Development Goals started, where there were some proof of concepts that could be taken to the next level. So, you know, trailing Jeff and my wife around and visiting the Millennium Villages, uh, one of the thoughts that I had, and it's going to be a, a, a thing that I'd love if you wanted to ask questions later, you can, or even give me some advice. One of the things that I was impressed with was the idea that, you know, two ways of improving health uh, aside from just coming up with better drugs and vaccines, one is preventing disease before you have it in places where they don't have any doctors and nurses. And then the question is delivery, right? 
So now the question is, how in the world are we going to ever create enough doctors and nurses in the developing world to be able to deliver any kind of services that we would need to have healthy villages, much less in the, all the uh, slums and in, in, in the big urban areas and so on. So I thought maybe that one kind of concept would be to be able to create uh, or to use, I guess, uh, the, the tools like this, connectivity and smartphones, to uh, proliferating transformational approaches to mobile and rapid uh, diagnostics and monitoring, uh, to exploit the uh, power of uh, artificial intelligence and, and big data analytics, and social networking itself, where people can learn from each other, whether with, before they have to actually, if they got good information from somebody else, as opposed to getting f false news, fake news. And the question is, how can you do that? How can you deliver that? So one of the things that, I, I, that I've been thinking about, and I was sort of shocked to find that some of the master's students didn't know what, what this was, and I wonder how many people in the room do or don't know. You know, we think about India and it's cataract surgery that's super cheap and it's like a really wonderful thing. But the part about India that interests me is the ashes. Do we all know what ashes are? Accredited social health care work, uh, activists, they call them. Or in Ethiopia, the version of this is community health workers. I'm, do we all know what they are? Uh, right now, I understand that Ghana has finally funded 20,000 of these people. So the concept here is that if we're not going to be able to create 100 new, 1,000 new medical, academic medical centers and create millions of new doctors and nurses in these places and prevent them from going to UK or somewhere and, and, and giving treatment to people and making a lot of money, what if we create these kind of uh, facilitator healthcare workers that could be transformational because they can be a kind of a win-win. On one hand, they make a bit of money and they then have success for their families because they get paid some small amount of money but it's good in their area. And on the other hand, they are able to take backpacks with rudimentary uh, both diagnostics and uh, you know, drugs, a little bit of drugs that are simple drugs, but smartphones so that they can actually connect into clinics somewhere or to experts and make a difference. I mean, I have another point about this in, the, in that slide. I'm stealing that slide just from oh, an idea that existed already five years ago to create a million of people like that, a million community healthcare workers who could in guarantee that every single village would have one person who's knowledgeable enough to be able to go to the children and the mothers and see something and at least know if they can immediately treat it or do something with it. And if not, they can take pictures, they can do a quick uh, text, they can go back to the clinic, find out what's going on, and maybe even order up an ambulance or something like that. So that's kind of uh, a question from me to you in your world, is whether this is a viable idea, because to me it's sad that five years went by, now we're in the SDG world, and I think that the only people that are exploiting it at any kind of scale are India, Ethiopia, and maybe Ghana now. So now, having uh, preached to, hopefully preached to the choir to you about how science technology could be arrayed and put in the hands of people who are facilitators that could make transformational difference in large numbers if we actually started thinking in a sort of out-of-the-box approach instead of just making more, uh, you know, investing more money in more um, academic medical centers and more buildings and more nurses would be great if we would do it. I want to take you into education and, and show you that the same issues exist in education. So uh, here you see that the idea is quality early childhood education for all, the first of those, equal access for all adults, I want to touch on that one, uh, all adults to what I call skilling. And you might say, uh, because you're in health and not in education, why are we talking about adults? And the answer is, uh, in part, that we have a world uh, where uh, advances are happening so quickly that companies in the private sector, in the developed world, can't find people who are skilled to do the jobs that they need. And if you look at 
uh, something that's you know interesting. I, I guess I can tell you about. Uh, if you look at the uh, whole Gulf area, you have tens of thousands of young men who, because there's so much money around, just want government jobs, and they have no interest or ambition to be able to become entrepreneurial and do anything that's important for their country, uh, unlike the women. By the way, the women are all in school and wanting to run everything, which is great, but we're losing, in that case, men at, at scale. We all know we're losing women. I'm going to tell you one quick uh, anecdote about Japan that's an interesting one. The Japan Science and Technology Agency came to our academy with a group to tell, tell us about their challenge and ask us if we had ideas on how to address it. And they showed us a bunch of charts about a study that they had done on what the kids are learning in school in their science classes. And there were two very shocking things. If I had them, I should have made uh, slides for you. One was showing how well the kids do in scores compared to kids in all the other countries. So, I mean, it won't surprise you, after Singapore, after maybe Shanghai, some parts of China, after Finland maybe, Japan is going to be one of the highest ranking the kids score off the charts in science and math. But then, next to that, they show whether the ki what the kids' attitudes are compared to the kids in those other countries toward science and math. They hate it. They're bored. They think, this, they, they, they think their classes are awful. Singapore kids like it. China kids love it. Finland kids like it. What is happening in Japan? Then they flip to the next chart that's astonishing. And you just sort of imagine kind of a, a spread with uh, bar graphs. And on, the, on your left, imagine the biggest top bar graph. What do most teachers in Japan teach in science? And what are the least, what, are, what, are, what topic is the least taught? So on the left is 80 something percent are teaching, are you ready for this? Plant science, agriculture, agriculture science. Over on the right, the lowest was IT. I said, like, how is this possible in a country like Japan? They said, well, our teachers are so traditionally trained. They only know plant science from the rice and stuff. And they have never learned, and they're nervous about IT. Well, no wonder the kids are like bored to death. So question is, that's why I want to touch on skilling, because the skilling issue is an issue that we have to get to. And, and, and I guess I have it on this, on this slide. We have to be able to do skilling and not just educating. Because educating right now is, is teaching teachers and teaching students a bunch of facts that are not teaching them how to uh, deal with the, with, the, with the rest of the world as we know it. So um, we can use, this is exactly the same slide, isn't it, as the health one, except that we now say that we're going to use this for educational purposes. Oops, how did that happen? That's weird. Something weird happening? I'm wanting to just get back, I guess I wanted to get back to 15 for a second. Maybe I was there, okay. So what I wanted to just touch on and then conclude this uh, discussion and then open up for questions is the following. And it's the equivalent of your world in, in global health. UNESCO says that uh, we have 850 million children not in school or in schools where they're not learning any skills for the future. UNESCO says the solution is by 2030, we're going to have 69 million new teachers. I personally don't know how I could imagine that any of the countries I can think of are going to produce 69 million new teachers above the level of teachers we have. But if they did, why would they be any better than the teachers that we have now? And again, I'm going to tell you a little interesting anecdote about our own country. Um, so in our own country, there's a, there's a ed tech investor named Jeffrey Leeds, one of the most successful. And, and Jeffrey has been funding a small company called Accu. And the principle of Accu is about three years old now. The principle is that he's identified that the second tier, third tier universities in this country, and especially the junior colleges, that many of the teachers, the majority of the teachers, are losing a lot of their students. They're dropping out. They're, they're not succeeding. Nobody knows exactly why. 
So uh, ACU has developed a 24-week certificate program where they online will train those teachers in the skills of teaching. And the amazing thing is the dropout rates are completely collapsing. In other words, kids are not dropping out from the same teachers that take the 24-week course. And every year they're doubling the number of universities paying for this. They're using online skilling to teach teachers how to teach. My former chair of my board, Nancy Zimfer, arguably one of the best, uh, highest educator, education experts in the United States, former chancellor of SUNY, when I told her this story, she said, Ellis, you just put a knife in my heart. And I said, why, Nancy? I knew she was making a bit of a joke. She said, because I spent my whole life trying to worry about reforming how we teach teachers how to teach. And I would like to think that the richest country in the world would be able to figure out how to make teachers uh, better teachers. And what you're telling me is some for-profit venture capitalist is going to create a company that, I, that my universities are going to hire to teach teachers how to teach? It makes me sad. But of course, if that's the only way we're going to be able to achieve it, I'm with you. So you know, the idea here for me is uh, uh, stealing from the notion of um, if we think it's a good idea, creating this cadre of a village of community health workers or ashes. Why not in education? Why not have millions of young people who are given the same connectivity and trained over a bunch of weeks to be able to go in and address and actually meet young people, meet older people, and figure out with some kind of a, a application on a smartphone what their potential is, which the Israelis, by the way, are really doing really well. That's a whole other story. So you find out what their potential is. What kind of jobs could they be successful at in their future? Or how could they reskill themselves for the next job? And then you either deliver some kind of apps that really, you know, through artificial intelligence, analyze this and deliver it to them. And then you have like uh, some ability through, again, uh, uh, artificial intelligence to see if they're learning, if it's working. And, and out of that, basically, that's a facilitator, an education facilitator that connects the young people and the older people to this kind of a notion of not educating people anymore, but skilling people. And then if we could educate people on top of that, that would be nice. So um, my closing point, which is um, these are really kind of uh, unusual, innovative ideas. They sit on the top of a, a platform that exists now. Science and technology has created that platform. It relates to the things that I've been trying to show you, social networking, uh, the, uh, the use of smartphones, the use of analytics uh, to be able to do that sort of stuff. And the question is, how could we all work together to make this happen at scale? The good news is that the current Secretary General Guterres and the Deputy Secretary General who's a most amazing woman named Amina Mohammed, and I encourage any of you, especially the women in the room, to Google Amina Mohammed, Sec Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, because there's no more inspiring woman on the planet. By the way, her job, she was called back from Nigeria where she was Minister of Clim Climate after she had done, had set up the Sustainable Development Goals. She was called back by Guterres. And Guterres said, we'll never achieve the Sustainable Development Goals if you don't come back here, Amina. And by the way, you have one other job that I need you to do, which is reform the UN. I think any of the older folks here can imagine what that might mean. So that's her job. But those two folks realize that this is really an opportunity for uh, the private sector to work in a public-private partnership for the first time with their agencies in order to try to do, bring to the education concepts this kind of novel, novel way of approaching it. And I think the same thing could be done in healthcare. And I don't really believe anymore that the uh, agencies by themselves or the countries by themselves are capable of doing this stuff. The World Bank right now is willing to put together a $10 billion education fund. But you know what the World Bank does. Maybe you don't. Some of you do. What it does is it offers this money to any country that comes up with a great plan. And the great plan is what the country can imagine. And what those countries will imagine are, I'm going to build a bunch of more schools, and I'm going to train a bunch of more teachers. I'm going to build a bunch of more hospitals and academic medical centers. I'm going to make some more doctors. And 
50% or 80% of that money is going to go into some kind of buildings and infrastructure. So that's really kind of my portrait that I wanted to portray to you. The thing is the entire world has changed because people like yourselves are willing to volunteer to do stuff like this. And we're all ready to work together if we can find mechanisms for doing that. And we have the science and technology behind us to be able to do novel things at scale. That's the hopeful part. And maybe we have some institutions that are willing to work together and make a difference. Thanks very much. So your thoughts? Your, yes. Reminds me. Can you hear me? Testing. Um, you were talking about taking backpacks and smartphones into these villages that are, you know, on the outskirts of the big cities that don't get much, you know, don't get anybody to visit much, and and help them out with medical. I remember a movie about Afghanistan. It was called Blackboard, and the guys walked around the whole country with blackboards attached to the back of their backs. Mm. Um, teaching people to read and write. And it kind of reminded me of that. You know, it's a, it's a little bit more, uh, you know, less, techno ne less technical. It's the low-tech version of, of what we, we, we could do, right? It sounds, it sounds like a great idea. Thank you. I, I think it's a hopeful one anyway. Anybody else want to teach me about why, why I'm na naive about public health? Yes, right here. One brave soul. I'm just a journalist. <laughs> First off, thank you for, for talking to us this evening. Um, I was especially um, thankful to hear about the history of the Millennium Development and Sustainable Development Goals, so thank you for that. Um, my question has to do with this, the private and, private and public cooperation that we're looking forward to the future as a, as a way to achieve these sustainable development goals and how we can um, use that. But I guess my concern is about the exploitation that can happen and the lack of, um, the lack of addressing the justice issues um, when some, some of these private companies are involved. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering if you can speak to that, how we can use the private and public cooperation without exploiting? So, <clears throat> you know, um, companies need incentives to do the right thing. And what I would say is we have nothing but, well, I was talking to Sandra, your dean, about this a little earlier. In a way, you can look at the, it's like the glass half full, glass half empty. You could look at the dark side of, of uh, the private sector, and people do, and they say we can't work with we can't work with Goldman Sachs because we know what they did with the Malaysians and they ripped off $11 billion. We can't work with Pfizer and J&J &J because they were caught doing X, Y, and Z or the F Purdue Pharma. We can't work with PepsiCo or Coke because they're killing everybody with sugar. We can't work with Lockheed because one of their bombs was used in Yemen. And I could just go on across every single private sector thing. Now, one of the things actually I think I'll use as an answer to you, my only answer, is uh, an interesting thing that was asked by one of the uh, master students earlier to me. They had noticed that the R Academy had done a project on sustainable fashion, how science and technology could transform the fashion industry, which for most people, I certainly didn't know it, is the second most polluting industry in the world. And the obvious issues, some of which are being addressed by science and technology through challenges, open innovation challenges and stuff, is to try to give, uh, get scientists in academia to come up with novel approaches. So for example, we need to replace spandex, which is in every one of our genes and so on. It's the most popular uh, product uh, that goes into uh, materials and it cannot be, uh, you can't recycle it. It destroys the ability of recycling the garment. And, and so, uh, or the, the dyes that are being used or the amount of water being used for uh, jeans and for just creating a t-shirt, you wouldn't believe the amount of water it uses. So you sign, that's the direct approach of using, having academia come up with ideas that would allow the companies to use better processes. But it doesn't address the real core issue. 
Because the real core issue in fashion is, is exemplified, as I understand it now, since I just learned about it, from fast fashion. Because you and maybe not you, but probably 75% of the people in this room are just buying tons of stuff that they don't need. And then it just gets thrown into landfill. And it's destroying. There's just no way to continue. And as the developing countries come, they all want a million outfits themselves, every, every sim, single family in person. So this is like a disaster. So the solution to that is to in, create an incentive. And this is like a hell of an interesting challenge for, uh, that macroeconomists and social scientists might work on. To create a financial incentive for the companies not to try to shove tons of stuff on shelves but to sell directly to you when only, when only when you need exactly what you need. And maybe they would get more money for the exact thing, so you wouldn't buy 100 different things you didn't use, but you would, and maybe you would have a pleasurable experience at getting the exact, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But this was what, this was a, a serious conversation during our workshop about how, what the ultimate challenge would be, would be to turn the entire incentive structure for the industry around so that it was, it was making more money by being more sustainable. And so this is like, the, to me, the way to address industry's issues. Is where I don't really believe that we can just demonize them and worry about this sort of stuff. We have to figure out, be creative. That's why we have you guys in school being creative and coming up with new approaches, you know, because we haven't done a very good job of it. Uh, that was great, thank you. Can I ask you to comment, slightly off topic, but uh, from your perch as the uh, president of uh, New York Academy of Sciences, what is the future of the scientist as she intersects with the public good? Because I think it's something that, uh, that we struggle with within public health. The schools of public health were ultimately created to create the workforce for public health, but we, of course, train scientists. We have a robust doctoral program, and many of our master's students go on to actually work directly in science, which, in, which is not directly aligned with the goal of a school of public health, which ultimately is to, you know, if you look at our mission for our school and the mission for any school, really, it's all to create a better, healthier world. So I'm just curious about your thoughts about, about scientists and their role in doing work for the public good and where the two separate and where the two intersect. Because you know, you presented your talk and you seamlessly blended science with the public good. But of course, it's much more complicated than that. So it's the, it, you know, your question also is, uh, is mirroring a question by one of the young PhD students who seemed to be worrying about what her future was because she wanted to stay in academia, but she, want, she seemed to be ask, trying to ask me how she could make a difference in the world if she stayed as an academic doing research. And you know, as an observer of the research side of the world, from especially at science, where basically there was a very low priority put on applied research and a very high priority on curiosity-driven research. That's what science and nature like, live for, unlike the Lancet or something. So I mean, that's, that w that's been one of these issues as an outsider looking into the science community that I've observed for a long time is that there's a kind of angst that exists between on the one hand, people want to feel proud that they are doing pure research, un, uh, you know, un, uh, uh, influenced by, you know, any base motives, and that goes to a potentially not caring about, you know, the translational elements of going to, you know, making an improvement in people's lives, but just following your dreams and coming up with the most amazing new discovery, whether you know how it's going to relate to, the the actual planet that we live on or not to those people who are really willing to go and, uh, and, and care about the public good. And I don't really have, I don't think I have any special wisdom about it. All I will say is, and I said to, I think I said to that group after she asked that question, I said, like, I understand the issue of being proud of doing basic research without worrying about the public good. And I think we need that. That's clear that we need that. And maybe we shouldn't be bothering people who are able to make huge breakthroughs and with, about worrying about the public good. In my own life, I can identify with this now, though, in a way that I wouldn't have been able to identify with 20, 30 years ago. Because I was very proud when I discovered that I was able, as an English major, to be able to uh, do uh, investigative journalism 
ahead of everybody else and discover what happened in the Three Mile Island accident, or and then get promoted from things like that to become an editor, and I'm managing this staff of other writers, and, and I'm very proud that I've now made it to science, and I'm the editor of science, and every day people are telling me how powerful I am because either uh, I've done something good or I've turned down their paper. I mean, one of the ways it's like a wonderful thing to have to go into every dinner party and find out that somebody there is mad at you for turning down their paper. But, uh, and then, you know, taking over the academy in the beginning, I thought it was an interesting challenge. But for me, a little bit version of what a, maybe some scientists feel is like I wasn't really concerned with the public good at all. And to the degree that science plays, in, science magazines say, plays an important role in advancing science so that in, in the end it addresses uh, public good, I mean, that's nice, but who's thinking about it? I, I wasn't thinking about it. It was only when I actually started to go to the villages in Africa and saw what Jeff Sachs and my wife were doing that I actually started identifying with what you're gonna do, you know, which is where I really think that the satisfaction that I now see in being able to improve some people's lives is so extraordinary that I wish that 40 years ago I would have understood that. So now I just now the question, so I have the same question, I don't have an answer to this, is if I'm a young scientist in doing a PhD and I'm really excited by my research but I don't see the direct application of it, should somebody go in there and tell me, hey, you're gonna regret it if 40 years from now you haven't thought about the, the, you know, at least part of your, your, your time? And I'm gonna tell you one other little anecdote that I think you'll all enjoy um, uh, that's a, a different version of this. So there's a wonderful researcher on my board named Elaine Fuchs, who's a Howard Hughes investigator at Rockefeller University. At some time, people thought she might get a Nobel genetics of skin and stuff. And one of her top, uh, her top uh, students became a, a working scientist and did so well uh, with publications and that she's now at Yale and, and has you know, not only got tenure, but is really one of the most respected researchers at Yale. And about, as I was telling the students, about whatever it is, three months, four months ago, she decided after she woke up one day and turned on the TV, she couldn't take it anymore. And what do you think she did? She went down and, and, and applied to run for state senate in Connecticut. And that was a person that was pure researcher. And maybe that's a different way of worrying about the public good than having to distort your own your own lab work. So she was going to do her own lab work. She wasn't giving up the lab, but she was going to contribute, she hoped, to society. Sad news, she didn't win. But maybe, maybe who won is an excellent person too. I hope so. But anyway, so I don't know. That's not a very good answer. That's the only reaction that I can have about that. You, maybe you have a better answer. I'd like to hear what you would say about it. That's they would like to hear what you're, you're the dean. <laughs> Please join me in thanking you, Ellis. <laughs>